Good evening and welcome to the Tuesday, April 2nd, 2024 regular city council meeting. Uh, would you please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. May I have the roll call? Councilmember Francois. Here. Councilmember Silva. Here. Councilmember Wilk. Here. Mayor Pro Tem Darling. Here. Mayor Haskew. Here. Okay, before we start the regular meeting, I'm going to make some words here. Um, welcome to our meeting in the Walnut Creek City Council. The City Council is conducting this meeting from the City Council Chamber. This meeting is being video streamed and can be viewed live or later on the City's website. As some attendees may be participating in their first Walnut Creek City Council meeting, I wanted to welcome everybody and talk briefly about the public comment process. For each agenda item, there will be an opportunity for public comment on the item. Thus, if you desire to speak on an item on the agenda this evening, please hold your comments until the City Council considers that item. Additionally, we have a section on the agenda titled Public Communications, which is for public comments for items not on the agenda. Any comments during public communications should not relate to an item that is on the agenda for this evening. Consistent with section 9.5 of the City Council Handbook, 30 minutes will initially be allocated to communications for items not on the agenda. If we run out of time, those additional communications uh, will be provided at the end, will be available at the end of the open session portion of the meeting if necessary. If you desire to provide a public comment, please complete a speaker identification card and line up behind the lec lectern at the appropriate time. Wait your turn and then when you approach the lectern, please state your name and city of residence for the record. You will have two minutes to address the city council. Please keep in mind that this is a city council business meeting. The city council has adopted rules of decorum to ensure that meetings are conducted efficiently and effectively and that all members of the public have a full, fair and equal opportunity to be heard. The city council handbook outlines decorum expected in the city council chamber and can be found on our websites. All remarks should be addressed to the city council. Please do not use threatening, profane, or abusive language which disrupts, disturbs, or otherwise impedes the orderly conduct of a city council meeting. Again, each speaker will have two minutes to make your remarks. Written comments submitted and received up to two hours before the meeting have been posted to the city's website for public review and are included in the meeting record but will not be separately read into the record. Thank you for your patience. And we are on to uh, item 1C, which is the proclamation for cleaner Contra Costa month. And by the time I finish reading all the proclamations, you're gonna get tired of the sound of my voice. So let's start out. Whereas the health of our environment and economy and community is essential for current and future generations. Whereas the city of Walnut Creek, Contra Costa County and sustainable Contra Costa provide an online platform, Cleaner Contra Costa, where residents can find solutions and local resources to save energy, water and reduce waste to take meaningful climate action and to track the results. Whereas the Cleaner Contra Costa Challenge inspires citizens to join forces with neighbors, friends, and community groups to support each other's efforts and work together to create cleaner, healthier, and more vibrant communities for all. Whereas actions taken through Cleaner Contra Costa will have added benefits of reducing greenhouse gas emissions, saving money, advancing community goals for health, safety, economic vitality, energy, independence, and a quality of life. Whereas 900 participating Walnut Creek households have collectively saved 
346,000 pounds of greenhouse gas emissions, 417,000 gallons of water, and $77,000 since this initiative started in 2019. Whereas the city of Walnut Creek supports this collective effort bringing awareness and local action to the pivotal issues facing our planet, because when we reduce our impact by conserving resources and investing in local solution, everyone benefits. And whereas community members of Walnut Creek and the county are encouraged to form teams and take action together at cleanercontracosta.org, now, therefore, I, Luella Haskew, Mayor of the City of Walnut Creek, on behalf of the Walnut Creek City Council, do hereby proclaim April 2024 as Cleaner Contra Costa Month to bring the community together in action for a healthy, clean, and sustainable region and encourage residents to find resources and join the challenge and cleanercontracosta.org. Um, I believe there is a Laura Worley here to collect this. I gotta take a bunch of deep breaths, gotta add another one to go. Um, enjoy that and uh, please share your words with okay, us. Okay, thank you so much. Okay. Hi, everybody. Thank you, Mayor Haskew, City Council members. Thank you so much. My name is Laura Worley, and I am with Sustainable Contra Costa. We are a nonprofit that tries to connect our community to sustainable solutions. We've been around since 2008, and I'm here to share an update on Walnut Creek's progress on the Cleaner Contra Costa Challenge. So this challenge started in 2019 from a grant given by the Bay Area Air, Bay Area Air Quality Management District quite a mouthful, and um, certain partners including Contra Costa County, the city of Antioch, the city of San Pablo, and your very own Walnut Creek, so thank you for that. Together we've helped tens of thousands of people learn how to make changes to save water and energy, reduce waste, build healthier, more connected communities. So some of our programs include an annual awards gala to highlight individuals or businesses doing great sustainability work in our community, we have a Sustainable Leaders in Action youth program called, called SLEA, and they're currently working to get all cities in Contra Costa on MCE's clean energy. Um, and we run various workshops like backyard, composting, how to conserve water, all those things. We know that 77% of Americans are concerned about the environment and wanna live more sustainably, and they just don't know how, and that's where we come in. We have a website, called the Sustain, um, Cleaner Contra Costa Challenge that offers sustainable guides, actions, and resources that make a positive impact on our planet. It's free, it's open to everyone who lives or works in Contra Costa, and it's available in English and Spanish. It has over 90 different actions to save resources and reduce emissions. There's anything from small things like taking a shorter shower to bigger items like buying an EV car and everything in between. You may think you're doing it all, but there were so many things that I found I didn't know I could do to um, make a difference. It's renter-friendly, youth-friendly, um, and the greatest part, the website measures your progress. So you can enter your household energy profile, and as you check off actions that you do, it will measure the reductions you make. For example, if you take a one-minute shorter shower, you save about three gallons of water, and that equates to about 500 gallons of water per year, which also saves on your water bill, right? It shows you how much water, energy, gas, CO2, and money you save, not only for your household, but for the city and for the county. So Mayor Haskew just listed Walnut Creek's progress. They're doing an amazing job. We know that green cities attract more people, which is good for the local economy. So kudos to you all for doing that. And we also have pr impressive county-wide results. In fact, I think we're, the, we're doing the best out of all of the platforms in the United States. We've recruited over 5,300 households from Contra Costa, and collectively we've saved 3 million pounds of greenhouse gas emissions, 3.8 million gallons of water, 50,000 gallons of gas, and $650,000. It's very impressive. Thank you all for doing your part to create a stronger and resilient community. 
Working together, we can create a more healthy planet for our kids. And I'd love for you all to log in to cleanercontracosta.org and start your profile today. Thank you so much. Are there any questions? Whoa, whoa, whoa. Come back, come back, come back, please. Are there any questions or comments from the council? Good thing somebody thought of it after that. I can affirm that it's easy because I tried it right here. Yay, thank you. <laughs> Not that I hadn't done it, but I thought I'd try it again. And we're just, um, they're getting a new version of the website installed next week, which is supposed to be even snazzier and faster and more, looks more like an app for the young people. Um, so it's going to get even better. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Thank, thank you. Thank you for coming and helping keep the world a better place. Thank you. Okay, next on the agenda is a proclamation for uh, National Library Week. Are you ready? Whereas, libraries provide the opportunity for everyone to pursue their passions and engage in lifelong learning, allowing them to live their best lives. Whereas libraries have long served as trusted institutions for all members of the community, regardless of race, ethnicity, creed ability, sexual orientation, gender identity, and socioeconomic status. Whereas libraries strive to develop and maintain programs and collections that are as diverse as the populations they serve and ensure equality of access for all. Whereas libraries adapt to the ever-changing needs of their communities, continually expanding their collections, services, and partnerships. Whereas libraries play a critical role in the economic vitality of communities by facilitating, inter facilitating internet and technology access, literally, literacy skills, and support job seekers, small businesses, and entrepreneurs. Whereas libraries are accessible and inclusive places that promote a sense yeah. of local connection, advanced understanding, inspire civic engagement, and promote shared community goals. <gasps> Whereas libraries are cornerstones of democracy, promoting the free exchange of information and ideas for all. Whereas libraries, librarians, and library workers are joining library supporters and advocates across the nation to celebrate National Library Week, now therefore I, Luella Haskew, Mayor of the City of Walnut Creek, on behalf of the Walnut Creek City Council, do hereby declare the week of April 7th to 13th, 2024 as National Library Week. Okay, and... Um, Addie, are you here? Come on down. Um, first, I just want to thank the council for having me today. Um, I am new to the Walnut Creek Library, so I haven't had the opportunity to meet many of you, so thank you for this opportunity. I've um, been at the Walnut Creek Library since October, but have worked with Contra Costa County Library since 2017, so I'm very familiar with um, the library. And I just want to give a very brief presentation. I won't take up too much of your time um, in honor of National Library Week. <coughs> So National Library Week is a time to recognize the many ways in which libraries such enrich our lives and the essential role libraries and library staff play in strengthening communities. As the branch manager of the Walnut Creek Library, I'm extremely grateful to work for this community and Contra Costa County and for the dedicated and hardworking colleagues I interact with on a daily basis as they have a true passion for librarianship and strive to meet the needs of the Walnut Creek community every day. So just a few statistics about the library. Um, circulation of library materials increased by 15% during the fiscal year 2022 to 2023 compared to fiscal year 2021 to 2022. We are also having an increase in our ebook checkouts, which um, I'm sure has uh, many of you are aware. Ebook checkouts have increased by 22% compared to the previous fiscal year. Um, and since the pandemic, ebook usage has just massively grown um, both um, nationwide and within our system. 
Um, more people are becoming comfortable coming back to our facilities again, um, but we've also continued to grow virtually as well. We had a 38% increase in in-person visits throughout the county and a 20%, 21% increase of virtual visits. So from all of these statistics, you can see that libraries are still very relevant in our um, communities and are still actively used in so many different ways. In case you were wondering, these are some of the most popular books from 2023, um, broken down by different audience levels. Um, some people are really interested and fascinated by what people are reading. So these are some of the most popular books from the past year. And these are just a few highlights from some services that are taking place throughout the, co the county, not specific to Walnut Creek. Um, we introduced a new early literacy van called the Rolling Reader. You may see it around town. It has a little fox mascot and travels weekly to various sites throughout the county um, to provide story time and other activities for children zero to five. And it's usually something that we, outreach we provide in underserved or vulnerable, vulnerable communities. Um, because of the increase and in demand for ebooks and other digital resources, we've continued to grow our collection through these digital resources. Um, this includes Overdrive and Libby magazines, as well as digital comics. Um, if you're a regu regular ebook user, these show up on our Libby app. We also now have access to Alexander Street, which has audio and video collections highlighting music, dance, and theater content. And these are all completely free with your library card. And we will have some new digital resources coming in the next couple of months. So please keep an eye out for those. Lunch at the library is a program aimed at preventing a summer nutrition gap while providing engaging and fun educational activities for participants. It's offered at nine libraries throughout the county. And this past year, we served over 13,000 meals to different families. And um, Allie Bernbach is the manager at the Walnut uh, Ignacio Valley Library, and she's not able to be here with me today. Um, so these are just a few highlights from some things happening locally. Um, Ignacio Valley continues to offer class visits for local elementary schools. They have two weekly story times, one for ages zero to two and one for ages three to five. They also have weekly teen programs, including game night and a Spanish language book club for adults. They had a number of successful cultural celebrations this past year. Um, their Dia de los Muertos celebration in October had 146 attendees and 190 attendees for their Lunar New Year celebration in February, which you can see pictured here. And then just a little bit from us um, across the street in downtown Walnut Creek Library. Um, first, I want to acknowledge this mural that is pictured here. Um, this was painted by Net Tesfe, who is now on the Walnut Creek Arts Commission. Um, it's a beautiful mural. It's in our children's room. We encourage you to come by and see it in person. Um, it was completed due to a grant we received from the Lesher Foundation in collaboration with the Walnut Creek Library Foundation. And we were also recently awarded another grant from the Lesher Foundation, which will go towards youth services in this upcoming year. Um, we have story times for babies, toddlers, and preschool children three days a week. Um, we create and implement regular cultural displays and programs, and we have ongoing events for all ages every month. Um, some upcoming events you may see are our Music in the Library series, which promotes local schools. We'll be working with Las Lomas to have their band come to the library. Um, they, we also work with local businesses and musicians. We will have a college scholarship series for teens, and then a number of special children's events, including summer reading and a planting workshop coming up. And we're also bringing back our Insiders program, which, was, which is a program for adults with developmental disabilities. Um, it's a monthly program. It was extremely popular pre-pandemic, and we see a need for that within our community. So that will be starting um, later this month. And many of these programs are sponsored by the Walnut Creek Library Foundation, as well as the Friends of the Walnut Creek Library, so we really thank them for all that they do for us. 
And lastly, I just wanted to point out our Rossmore lockers, which are located up at the Rossmore community. The Friends of the Walnut Creek Library just um, contributed funds to add 30 additional lockers to the Rossmore community. So there's now 56 lockers up at Rossmore. It's basically like another library within our um, community. And um, we're able to reach residents at this offsite location. It's a really wonderful service. And that's all I prepared. I just wanted to thank you again for your time and see if you have any questions for me. Thank you. Do we have questions, Kevin, please? I don't have any questions. I just want to say thank you very much. I love the libraries. Even it had been years since I'd actually checked out a book. And then about 10 years ago, I started looking at some of the digital books. And now when I go on a trip, especially if it's a longer trip, there are just thousands on the on the Libby Digital Books. It's amazing. And I do want to give a shout out for the Ignacio Valley branch, which I live near. And I had the, the occasion to go there a couple of years ago on just a random day because my internet was out at home. And I went in there and I could not believe on just a random weekday how many hundreds of students came in there from small children for reading, for story time, to students after school. It was amazing. What a resource. We don't hear enough about it, and I really want to thank you for everything that you're doing. Thank you so much for that acknowledgement. So the, <clears throat> the statistics you showed at the beginning, those are for the county as a whole, correct? That's correct, not just for oh, Walnut Oh, darn. Creek. I just thought maybe those six million books <laughs> in circulation were across um, the street. Wal Walnut Creek is a very busy library, particularly downtown here. We see hundreds, if not thousands, of people, um, especially during the week and on the weekend. So it's a very popular branch, and um, there's always something happening there. But yes, the circulation is also very high, specifically at the downtown branch here. Remind me how many libraries are in the county system. There are 26. It's 26, and we have two of them. Lucky us. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. And lastly, this is an advertisement. If you're interested in helping the Library Foundation, the Authors Gala is coming up on April 27th. It will be at the downtown library, and it's a great opportunity to um, gather with folks. And I think we will probably most of us will be there and help support the library. So. That's the Library Foundation, if anybody in the audience. Whenever I have a captive audience, you know, I have to sell something to you guys. It's on the, li it's on the library fa uh, website, the foundation. Yeah, that too. Yeah, it is. Okay. Thank you again Thank for your you time. So much. Okay. Now it is my pleasure to uh, ask Matt. Matt? Is it Matt? Oh, good. Um, to come forward and give us some information about what's going to happen at the Lesher Theater this year. Mayor Haskew and members of City Council, my name is Matt Morrow. I'm the Artistic Director of Center Repertory Company. And I'm here to give you a special sneak peek of our 57th season, which will officially be announced April 16th. That's right, Center Rep is 57 years old this season. So we are all buying sports cars, getting hair plugs, and moving to Rossmore. <laughs> Just kidding, we don't have the budget for that. But seriously, isn't it awesome that this city has supported one of the oldest professional theaters in the entire Bay Area? Thank you for your longstanding support and belief in the power of theater as a vital community asset. To celebrate our 57th year of theater in the East Bay and my first season as artistic director with Center Rep, I've programmed a bold season that honors our roots in celebrated classics while reveling in a future forward vision. We launched the season in September with a revival of a classic with a twist, Arsenic and Old Lace by Joseph Kesselring, directed by moi. This grandmother of dark comedies gets a mischievous and campy makeover in this revival production that honors Cinerep's history of producing classics. Arsenic and Old Lace is about a newly engaged theater critic, Mortimer, who discovers his two elderly aunts are harboring some killer secrets. Just as his estranged brother descends upon their family home, upending everything he thought to be true in his life. To save his family, his fiance, and his own sanity, Mortimer must learn to navigate a new world gone mad all before the eight o'clock curtain. Uh, deliciously macabre, classically winsome, and queerishly delightful, get ready for a new vision for one of theater's most enduring comedies. 
We follow arsenic and old lace with a partnership with Marin Theater Company. And actually, you're going to see this theme throughout my first season. It's really important for theaters to work together. So we're linking arms with other professional theaters uh, in the region to uh, steady our uh, march forward. So we're partnering with Marin Theater Company with the production of Dragon Lady, written and performed by Sarah Porkalob and directed by Andrew Russell. Broadway powerhouse Sarah Porkalob takes center rep by storm in her acclaimed one woman musical adventure. Dragon Lady takes place on the 60th birthday of the family matriarch Maria Porkalob, who unspools her mesmerizing origin story to the rapt attention of her granddaughter Sarah. In a tour de force act of honoring her grandmother's life and legacy, Sarah masterfully embodies countless colorful characters from Maria's sensational history, from a Manila nightclub teeming with gangsters and lovers to a Washington State trailer park where the bonds of family are forged. Chauffeured by a wickedly talented live band and Sarah's powerhouse vocals, you'll be transported by the solo musical adventure that has critics and audiences across the country raving. Next up, we have our annual tradition of a Christmas carol, which returns to delight and entertain families across Contra Costa County for the holidays. And then we launch the new year with something brand new, the world's premiere of a graphic noir thriller, Froggy, by Jennifer Haley. Nearly a decade in the making, this century-rich roller coaster of a thriller springs theater into the future in this altogether wild new work from a, t from a team of today's groundbreaking theater artists. Froggy is set in the year 2007, and motion capture 3D animation has taken the film and video gaming industry by storm. For Froggy, it's been a year of obsessing over her actor boyfriend's disappearance. When she discovers clues to his whereabouts embedded in a violent underground video game, Froggy dives down a deadly rabbit hole to uncover his and her own fate. From the brilliantly demented mind of award-winning playwright Jennifer Haley, who co-wrote David Fincher's Mindhunter for Netflix, and designed by Obie award-winning multimedia wonderkin Jared Mazzacci out of New York City, Froggy is next-generation storytelling, fusing the styles of graphic novels, film noir, and today's revolutionary virtual media to create a thrilling new theatrical event not to be missed. Next, we celebrate the beginning of spring with the East Bay premiere of The Roommate by Jen Silverman. This contemporary classic asks the question, who says being single, middle-aged, and an empty nester has to be a bummer? Now in her mid-50s and recently liberated from her child and husband, Sharon needs a roommate to share her Iowa home. Robin, also in her mid-50s, seeks refuge and a chance to reboot. When the two become roomies and their odd couple of a friendship deepens, truths emerge along with hidden talents and secret desires. Part mystery, part comedy, and altogether original, this two-hander contemporary classic takes on what it means to be middle-aged, middle class, in the middle of America, and how to change it all by throwing caution to the wind. We close the season with a world premiere co-production musical that is still under wraps. So I can't share that with you today, but it will be announced on April 16th, and I can tell you that it's also very, very funny and a little bit naughty. So bursting with mischief, magic, and a touch of mayhem, Center Rep's 57th season dynamically explores the boundaries of storytelling through a collection of works that moves from the intimacy of cross-generational relationships to the complexities and joys of finding our place in an ever-evolving 21st century world. It's designed to sate the appetite of our loyal, loyal audience base while growing a more diverse audience base from all over the Bay Area. And that's my first season with Center Rep. Thank you. It just takes my breath away. So are there any other questions or comments? Yes, please. Thank you so much. And it's exciting what you have on tap. But right now, there's still a few days left with The Great Leap, which I would have seen twice or three times in a short period of time. It was fabulous. Mm -hmm. Are there tickets still available? There are actually tickets still available. I'm so glad you asked and that you gave me that prompt. This is the last weekend. 
And it's, it's such a beautiful story about uh, a Chinese American family and their interpersonal relationships and relationships with the motherland of China. It's really beautiful and very, very funny. And very poignant. Yeah. I cried at the end. Okay. So, and laughed a lot. Yes. Did you have to tell me that? <laughs> well, I didn't cry that hard. Oh, good. <laughs> um, but it's a great story. It's about the opening of China. Mm -hmm. It is about the first um, basketball game between Beijing University and the University of San Francisco. UC UCSF. Mm -hmm. USF. USF. Yeah. And uh, what happens 20 years later, Tiananmen Square. I mean, it is a lot packed into 90 minutes. Yeah. Absolutely. So get tickets. Mm -hmm. Centerrep.org? That's right. Okay, there you go. Heard it here last. <laughs> Kevin, please. Uh, Matt, I just want to thank you and thank Center Rep as well. We are so fortunate to have just terrific regional theater here. And I don't think I ever really realized how important it is until COVID wiped out so many regional theater groups across the Bay Area, across California, the country. We are so fortunate. We've got people that come from all over the Bay Area to come see the, to our shows. And thank you. And, and yes, support regional live theater. Come to Walnut Creek and, uh, and eat before. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Yes. Yes, good. And when do those tickets go on sale? Do you know? Right, uh, April 17th, the day after our, our oh, announcement. Big announcement. Okay, thank you. The, the whole year to look forward to. So thank you. Thank you. I'm so excited. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for your support. You're welcome. Thank you. Bye. All right. Let me, uh, we're about to go to the consent calendar, but before we do, I'd like to remind the members of the public, if you would like to provide a public comment, the speaker identification cards need to be completed and turned into the city clerk. You will have two minutes to address the city council. Please keep in mind that this is a city business meeting. The city council has adopted rules of decor decorum to ensure that the meetings are conducted efficiently, effectively, and all members of the public have a full, fair, and equal opportunity to be heard. The City Council Handbook hands, outlines the decorum expected in City Council and can be found on our website. All remarks should be addressed to the Council. Please do not use threatening, profane, or abusive language which disrupts, disturbs, or otherwise impedes the orderly conduct of the Council meeting. Upon the, okay, so that's it. And the reason I ask that is we're going to public comment and, uh, I mean, excuse me, consent calendar. Sorry. I've got, yes, consent calendar. Does any member of the council wish to pull an item? One item has, I, um, 2G has been pulled. Yes, are we still pulled? Yes, it has pulled. So there being. Uh, I'd like to pull 2E, Madam Mayor. 2E, okay. Anybody else want to give us a comment? No. Move to approve items 2A through D. Second. Um, and F. And F. Um, and F. Yes. Second. Mayor, did you call for public comment? I was consent? going to. She was just so fast. It was hard. Um, so this is a moment for public comment on anything other than item G on the consent calendar. Does anybody in the audience wish to make a comment? Not seeing anybody make a move with a little yellow card. So we have a motion to approve. And the second, may we have a roll call vote? Councilmember Silva. Aye. Councilmember Wilk. Aye. Councilmember Francois. Aye. Mayor Pro Tem Darling. Aye. Mayor Haskew. Aye. Motion carries unanimously. All right. Item E is up next. Matt, do you want to make some comments? Thank you, Mayor. I would. This is the, the Gardens at Heather Farm rehabilitation project. And it's kind of, it's a success story among staff and our nonprofits. And, and many of you may not know, but we experienced extensive damage, water damage at that facility out near Heather Farm Park. I believe it was in the fall of 2022. And one of our valuable nonprofit partners, the Gardens at Heather Farm, which hosts garden tours and weddings and things like that, wasn't able to operate all of last year. Th thanks to the good hard work of our public works staff, including Rich Payne and his whole team 
and our city manager, I think, was even had to get involved at one point and make some direct dials to con fire so that we could get things moving. And I just wanted to express uh, my great appreciation. The, we're accepting that work is complete. The gardens at Heather Farm is back in business. You can book all your events, weddings, promotions, anything you'd like to do there. They're back open for business. It's just a beautiful spot. It's a sanctuary, really, in the city where you can go and see uh, gardens and have an opportunity to, to take place in a, in a nice spot here in the city. So thank you to staff and uh, to everyone who had an opportunity to help make this happen. Yeah, thank you. Do you want to make a motion to approve? I will. Uh, I move to approve item 2E. Second, because it was a great place for my wedding reception years ago. Years ago. <laughs> <laughs> and it has okay. butterfly gardens and everything that makes you happy. All right, may I have a roll call vote, please? Councilmember Francois. Aye. Mayor Pro Tem Darling. Aye. Councilmember Silva. Aye. Councilmember Wilk. Aye. Mayor Haskew. Aye. Motion carries. And I'd like to acknowledge that the executive director of the gardens is here this evening. And, and would you please come forward because you have a piece of paper and I'm sure you want to share something. Thank you for that shout out. You're a hard act to follow. Um, Madam Mayor and City Council, on behalf of the Board of Directors and our staff at the Gardens at Heather Farm, I am here to tell you how grateful we are to you for your support um, during a very difficult time uh, when a plumbing uh, malfunction resulted in a catastrophic flood that truly almost destroyed our building. Our nonprofit has been a partner with the city for 52 years. We raised the funds to build the building and to design the garden, install it, and we've continuously maintained it um, for all of these years. And we look forward to partnering with the city um, on future efforts. The renovation of the building that we've called home since 1982 will allow us to continue our educational programming for both adults and children. Our children's natural science classroom programming and field trips to the gardens in combination with our contracts with Contra Costa Water District, Mountain View Sanitary District, Recycle Smart, and Central Contra Costa Sanitary District to manage their children's education programs has allowed us to reach over 18,000 kindergarten through eighth grade children this school year alone. Our new homeschool program provides a science programming for 60 children a month. One of our adult programs this year will teach gardening in small spaces for those living in condominiums and apartments. Our facility also provides the foundation for the fundraising that's necessary to maintain six acres of intensively cultivated public gardens, which is open to the public free of charge. We pledge to maintain the gardens as a place of beauty and serenity in a chaotic world. On Sunday, April 28th, we'll be holding an open house from 3 to 6 p.m. And we're inviting the council, city staff, and all of you, the public, to come and stop by and admire our newly re renovated facility. Thank you again for your support. And I personally want to thank Heather Ballinger and in particular, Rich Payne and the public works staff who came and answered my call for help during a real moment of crisis. This has been an extraordinary experience and I can't tell you how grateful we are for your support. Thank you, would you share your name please? Oh, sorry, Joan Lucchese, Executive Thank you, Director. Joan, it's lovely to see you too. Thank with you. a smile on your face, <laughs> way to go, okay. Next on the agenda is public communications, and I'm not going to read all that stuff because you're a bright audience and you're going to know what you're supposed to do. Two minutes, card, um, not on the agenda. If you remember all of that and you qualify, please make sure the cards are there. And I'm going to break a little rule by asking our supervisor, Ken Carlson, to come forward first. Thank you, Mayor Haskew and council members. You know, you started off this meeting with proclamations recognizing our environment and sustainability, the great work our libraries are doing. I apologize, I don't have a proclamation for you. <laughs> but I think I have the next best thing. I do have a check that I'm really, I, you know, I wanted to take the opportunity to come and personally present it to you um, because I'm just so grateful. And I think our community needs to understand why. 
Um, so during the early stages of the pandemic, December of 2020 through the end of May of 2021, Walnut Creek was a partner in our vaccination program with the Contra Costa County. And because of that, the impact that you all have had on the lives of our residents here in Contra Costa County is truly amazing. You know, Contra Costa County came in, and this is not something really to brag about, but it is. We were the second lowest COVID-19 fatality rate in the United States during that pandemic. Yeah. And it, and it came about because of partners like Walnut Creek. I mean, I just, I, granted, I have a long history here in Central Contra Costa County, but my pride and joy is the work that you all have done. You are true leaders. We see that all the time with the work you're doing to sustain our libraries, to bring arts and culture, uh, the work you did to provide what economic vitality you could during the pandemic, set examples, um, and you continue to set examples, standing against uh, racism, anti-Semitism, and all the other work you're doing. So, although it's a small check of just over $14,000, every dollar counts in the work we do, right? But again, it just goes to show what partnerships can accomplish, and we are proud to, to be partnered with you and the successes we share. So, with that, I'm going to present this, if I may, to the mayor. I know who's going to hold my breath. <laughs> <laughs> oh! <laughs> Next time I'll get it on a phone record. Yeah. <laughs> Hard to put in the NPS. Thank you. Thank you for that. Thank you. All right. All right. Now it's time for everybody else to stand up behind the, the lectern and come for public comment. Remember, it's not on items. It's not for items on the agenda. I will stop you if you break the rule. My name is Joe Easley, and I live at 1550 Stanley Dollar Drive 2B. We've lived in Rossmore in Walnut Creek for almost three years. I'm a retired United Methodist pastor from Indiana and now attend Lafayette United Methodist Church and serve there and in the community in a variety of ways. Our pastor, Lauren Michelle Stevens, wanted to be here tonight but had another commitment already and asked if I would represent her and the church. I'm very happy to do that, especially since bridging the gaps that divide people has been one of my passions and emphasis in ministry. I've felt called to stand against all of the things that cause one group of people to consider another group not worthy of respect, whether it is because of race, religion, sexual orientation, gender identity, or political party. I've been active in interfaith study and work for more than 20 years. My faith calls me to honor the dignity of every person and recognize each as a child of God, even if they call God by a different name or do not believe in God. My study and worship with people of other faiths has led me to respect other traditions and enrich my life by seeing both the uniqueness of each faith and the values and practices we share. Jesus called wholehearted love of our Creator and loving our neighbor as ourself the two great commandments, both of which he drew from Hebrew Scripture. Treating others as we would want them to treat us is the golden rule, which is found in some form in the teaching of all major religions. Therefore, I join a variety of faiths here tonight to stand against hatred of any person or the demonization of any religion. This interfaith group tonight says anti-Semitism has no place in our community, nor does any other form of religious prejudice. Yeah. Yeah. Madam Mayor and members of the City Council, thank you so much for this opportunity to address you. Uh, my uh, name is the Reverend Peter Whitelock, and I'm uh, privileged to serve as a pastor of the Lafayette Arenda Presbyterian Church. First, thank you for your service to our community and the ways in which you are seeking to build up a better and a thriving Walnut Creek. Uh, we, uh, we do have many members who live and work in Walnut Creek, and uh, it is an honor to represent uh, not only them this evening, but also the other members of our church family. 
Uh, our mission is to be a welcoming and loving community of faith that learns, grows, and serves together. And as part of that mission, we are committed to public service, community partnerships, and active engagement with our interfaith partners. We are all together and need to work together for the common good. I stand tonight in response to expressions of anti-Semitism which have been voiced here and elsewhere in our community. In some instances, these statements have come from individuals identifying themselves as Christian. We believe this to be a gross misrepresentation of the Christian message and a betrayal of Christian virtues, the chiefest of which is love. The Presbyterian Church rejects anti-Semitism in all of its forms and deplores the rise of anti-Semitism in our nation and our world today. Incidences of anti-Semitism cannot be normalized or justified. We stand with our Jewish brothers and sisters in putting aside fear to stand against this plague and resist the negative stereotyping being promoted against Jewish people and their communities. We believe that our best future can only unfold as we work together across all lines of difference and diversity to build a world that is more just, kind, and respectful. We are all of us created, we believe, in the image of God. We are grateful for the work of our elected officials, such as yourselves, to build safer, healthier communities in which everyone can prosper. And I am confident that my words represent not only our faith community, but our denomination and Christians the world over. Thank you. Thank you. Ordinarily, we don't, we discourage um, rounds of applause, but it moved me deeply, so I kind of let it happen. Not next time. Um, okay. Um, any other people wish to make public comments? Uh, good evening, Madam Mayor and members of the council. My name is Jeff Elfont. I'm a resident of Danville and a business owner here in Walnut Creek, actually two businesses. And I come here tonight a little troubled um, because I basically come to the point with a re rebuke for our police chief Knox um, and some comments he recently made uh, to the media uh, that ma were made public um, that he had some negative comments regarding local online active media reporting of police department activities. Um, unfortunately, we live in a world of a bifurcated internet and traditional media world, and the coverage isn't always as fair as it perhaps should be or could be. Uh, we get skewed information from various sources, as we know, but uh, we have to embrace all of the media equally and sometimes it's not always positive, Chief, um, but it's something that you have to accept in the modern world. Um, I sympathize with you. As you can see, I'm formally with law enforcement. Um, I had a reasonably good experience myself regarding a criminal activity just two weeks ago with Walnut Creek PD. So I understand you have some very fine officers, and I'm always here to encourage you and uh, understand the obstacles you must work with that I did not. But uh, please be willing to accept uh, some transparency and uh, other points of view. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Last call for public comment. Seeing none, it looks like we're going to move on to council members, staff announcements, and reports on activities or requests. Uh, city attorney, are there any? Closed session, thanks. Uh, there was no closed session, therefore no closed session announcements. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, city manager, please. Uh, yeah, Dan Buckshy, city manager. Just two quick updates. I wanted to acknowledge a couple of staff. Uh, today was the last day of our city engineer, Steve Waymeyer. After uh, 22 years of working with the city, we did have a nice send off for him earlier today and also wanted to publicly thank him for all of his efforts and the tremendous impact that he's made on the community and the organization over uh, two decades of public service here at Walnut Creek. So thank you, Steve. I have a hunch he may not be listening since uh, he, was, he was done earlier, but in the event he is, uh, thank you. And then I also want to acknowledge our assistant city manager, Terry Kilgore, 
whose uh, last day with this city will be this Thursday. She is uh, moving with her family to Scottsdale, Arizona, and I want to thank her for all of her efforts. She was here during a very challenging five years in Walnut Creek's history, and uh, she also made a very significant impact here on the, on the community and the organization. So, Terry, I wish you uh, the best with your move, and thank you for everything you've done. Thank you. Kevin, I'm going to pick on you first. All right. Thank you. Terry <laughs> and Steve, wherever you are, uh, thank you so much. I heard more comments from business people that were, are part of development, our stores and restaurants that we go into every week as a community that said, thank you for having Terry Kilgore here. Do whatever you can to keep her here. And this was years ago over COVID and everything else, the business community is thriving in Walnut Creek, Terry, in large part to you. And I wanna applaud you for that. <laughs> the whole city management, but Terry, you have been really helpful and instrumental in that. Uh, all right, so I am the liaison for Ross Moore. And uh, the one thing that was brought up that I also have already relayed to our police department is they do have a request about some of the speeding and running of stop signs that's happening in Ross Moore. It seems to be an endemic issue there. It actually is an issue all over Walnut Creek and all over the state. We hear about this all the time, but I did pass that information on to our chief of police and Captain Hibbs, so they're following up on that with Ross Moore. Along with the mayor and council member, I think it was Silva, we were at the Plaza Ribbon Cutting. Was it Silva? Okay. Do I have that one right? Yeah, it was. Okay. Uh, the Plaza Ribbon Cutting at the corner of Mount Diablo and California. It was terrific to see the, uh, the upgrade that's there and look forward to many, many more years that will be uh, occurring at that spot. I am also a, uh, on the Environmental Quality Policy Committee for the California League of Cities. And we had our meetings in Burbank about a week, a little about a week and a half ago. We discussed a couple of issues in that committee meeting that are going to be pertinent for everybody. One was a discussion on PG&E fixed pricing and if California League of Cities will be taking a position on that. Essentially what this is going, what this is attempting to do is balance a bit of the needs of uh, what PG&E needs with if you are underprivileged or lower income, you're going to be paying a little bit less than than uh, higher income. Regardless, California League of Cities committee decided to, <laughs> voted to take a no position on this. There was a lot of discussion on both sides of that. Uh, we will hear again more about that. We vote to take, we, a, 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 to say oppose it or to no, take a neutral we, no we, position? We voted to take a neutral position. Okay. We are not, a, we are, not taking sides on that particular issue. The other discussion point wasn't a vote, but a discussion point was reviewing how water usage will be calculated for cities in the future years. Basically, there will be more categories of water uses that cities will need to account for. This is going to take staff time. I have no doubt our public works department, as well as public works departments across the state, are uh, are uh, investing their staff and time into doing this right now. But we spend a lot of time looking at what those categories are. I also was part of an outdoor dining discussion along with the mayor on the Plaza Parklet at North Main and Cypress. This is the little parklet area out there that had some bumps previously. Now it doesn't. We're looking to see what are some of the ways that we can help activate that area. So we're reviewing some ideas right now. That'll eventually come to city council uh, to, t to see what we're going to do with that area in front of the restaurants and the retail stores. So more to follow on that in the, in the months ahead. And then lastly, I was, part, I was at the Youth Ambassadors event. I'm going to let Cindy Darling talk about this one because she's the liaison for that. Yeah. But that's just great to see that we have the exchange programs going on again now post-COVID, and it's thriving. So I'm going to let you talk about that one. Okay, that seems like a graceful um, transition. Okay. So I'll start off with Sister Cities. Um, Council Member Wilk and... Councilmember Silva joined me that night, and the kids from Hungary and Italy came and did a kind of an interpretive dance about their countries, <laughs> and it was really great fun. You could tell that the kids were really enjoying their visit. Um, Mayor Haskew and I got to tell them about the city earlier in the week. It was really a lot of fun. Um, a couple of us made it to the Lesher um, Foundation's 30th anniversary, and that was great to celebrate. Um, if you don't know, the Lesser Foundation doesn't fund area 
like specific problems, they fund an area. So anything in Contra Costa County. And um, it was great to meet all the nonprofits that are associated with them because they really work across, you know, the symphony together with the Trinity Center is having homeless people, allowing them to go to the symphony, you know, for free. So it was a great opportunity. Um, MCE met adopted our budget. We are not looking at a rate increase this year. Um, on the fixed rate, we have not taken, MCE has not taken a position on it. It's not a slam dunk that it's less expensive for poorer families. Um, there are some pros and cons to that, so we should, hopefully that'll just die an untimely death. Um, but we did celebrate Hercules is one of it, our new partner cities, and uh, I think there's one or two still outstanding cities in Contra Costa but for the most part, we have all joined up. Um, many of us went to the future of Walnut Creek held by the chamber, and that was great. We were ably represented by the mayor Haskew um, and the city manager. We were very ably mentioned by all of them, including the chief of police. Um, I also went to, I, I ventured out of Walnut Creek and went to Lafayette because they were recognizing John Coleman as citizen of the year. As you might remember, John has been on the East Bay Mud board for 31 years and he is retiring off the board. And so Lafayette recognized him. And, you know, I worked with John for years beforehand. He is one of the people that broke legal impasse on getting American River water to East Bay Mud. And it's an important part of firming up our water supplies, and it took somebody of vision at East Bay Mud to say this. They had been fighting since 1970 in court. We had spent millions of dollars on that court issue, and he just finally said, you know, it's a none. That's no more fighting. He also helped us more recently with Hope Solutions, uh, which is a small um, cottage project on a piece of faith formation land, and East Bay Mud staff were talking about requiring five water meters for it, which would cost probably half the cost of the entire project. And John worked with um, Hope Solutions and helped them find a solution there that didn't cost quite so much money. Um, and last thing, I think last time we were here, we talked about um, fun things going on out at Boundary Oak. Well, my friends and I went to the seafood boil there on Saturday a week ago. And the new um, woman who is the head chef out there is just a kick in the pants. She, and she, she, she had gone and got buckets to put the seafood boil in. So there's mussels and clams and crab and corn, and it was really good. And uh, they're going to do Cinco de Mayo. So all of my friends at the table are making plans to go back for Cinco de Mayo because it was good and a lot of fun. Yep. Council Member Silva. Thank you very much. And it's really exciting to see so many people in our council chambers tonight. Don't disappoint us. The, um, in addition to the Great Leap at the Lesher Center, I want to announce that on Saturday, April 13th, we'll be opening a new show in the Bedford Gallery called Native, Rediscovering Native America. And it should be a really interesting show. The um, Recycle Smart, which is basically responsible, it's a joint agency between six local agencies, Danville, La Mirinda Cities, the county, and Walnut Creek, has released a request for proposals for new 10-year contracts for services for transfer, disposal into the landfills, recycling of our recyclables, organic composting, and mixed-use composting. And we're looking to get competitive proposals so we can get a 10 to 15 year franchise agreement with one or various companies in order to basically meet our recycling and sustainability goals and also have efficient service at the curbside. And um, I serve on that board along with Council Member Francois. The two of us represent Walnut Creek on that board. The um, last Thursday evening, the mayor and I traveled to, the, we carpooled to the city, so we were sustainable. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm on a theme here. And I uh, went to an award ceremony sponsored by the East San Francisco Business Times, and they were honoring the Waymark Apartments, which is the name for the 350 apartments at the BART station, and as one of the best examples of multifamily project um, in the last year. And we were honored to be a part of it. 
Luella as mayor and me as being the longest sitting council member right now. It took a long time to get that project out of the ground and done. So we were um, delighted to be there. The um, Walnut Creek has a homeless task force. It's comprised of volunteers, including representatives of the Trinity Center, um, Walnut Creek PD, our housing department, Contra Costa, and they had a meeting a couple of weeks ago, and two things of note. The uh, annual point in time count, which is when the, um, na nationally they count the unhoused, um, was done efficiently. The numbers are not yet out, but we will hear more about that in the coming months. And also, the group received a presentation from the Association of Bay Area Governments on a housing bond that ABAG is looking to put on the ballot for the nine counties of the Bay Area um, this coming November. I also sit on the board of the Association of Bay Area Governments and we received a presentation on that. Effectively, it would create a, a, an affordable housing loan agency with um, if the voters approve this bond money. It would um, fund it, and then the interest and earnings off of the lo the, len the loans would then self-sustain itself over time. It's a model being used by New York City. It would, um, for probably less than $100 a year for most of us, it would yield 10 to $20 billion, which could produce in the range of 10,000 to 15,000 affordable homes, which is desperately needed across the Bay Area. You'll be hearing more about that in the coming months and exactly what um, is put on the ballot. Then I will, that was what I would report um, of the Association of Bay Area governments as well. I also serve on a policy committee for the League of California Cities. Policy committee I serve on is housing and community and economic development. And we had a very interesting discussion about two bills that are in front of the state legislature. One of them is by Assembly Member Lori Wilson out of Solano, and it's related to thrift stores. It, is, it appears that um, it basically would require that we treat thrift stores exactly the same way as all retail stores. And the conversation became interesting because thrift stores have two interesting challenges that your regular retailer does not. They don't get their goods delivered in boxes, and they're not ordered, they are donated. So they end up at the back door, and so there's much more disposal that they have to manage than your normal retailer. And sometimes that disposal is used, it generates noise, because they're crushing things they can't use and things that are damaged and they can't sell to send them out. And so those two land use zoning issues crop up. So we had a very interesting conversation about that bill. Another bill that we talked about was a bill that we're going to actually, as peripherally related to what we're going to talk about under our regular act agenda tonight, um, Assemblymember Rebecca Barakayan, who represents a lot of Contra Costa, has put forward a bill that would basically make um, reproductive health care services a zoned use by right. And we had a robust conversation about that as well amongst people from all over the state. It appears that um, some planning commissions in the state are making decisions that are not really a what you'd call a land use decision, but a social issue decision. So it was an interesting conversation, but we did decide to take a, to recommend a position of support with um, amendments, and we've had conversations with the assembly member's office about what those amendments might be. And I will mention that in case you haven't heard, Walnut Creek has hit the top 10 list for wealthiest communities to retire in, but we're not Rancho Palos Verdes, which <laughs> was at the top, as was Laguna Beach. Uh, we're down number nine, right next to Cerritos, which is in the central um, Los Angeles County area, and we are nowhere near the average income of Rancho Palos Verdes. But it was nice to be in the top 10 of something, and that is basically a positive thing. Thank you very much. Councilmember Francois, I did not forget you. You're Excellent. Next. I was hoping you didn't, Mayor. Thank you. Um, as a liaison to the Chamber of Commerce, 
We had a presentation from Assembly Member uh, Rebecca Bauer Cahan where she did mention the reproductive uh, facility bill. She also said, surpri was surprising to me, that the number one issue that she and her colleagues are hearing from constituents about is utility rates. So that's something that they're forming a special session in the legislature to try to attack that and see what they can do to try to bring the rates down. Uh, which was good to hear about. And other items that were on the agenda for the chamber were a turnover in the chair. Audrey G has led the, was chair of the chamber for the last year. Matt Gouchard, who I believe is no, not, he's with us in this life, but not with us in the chamber, uh, will be serving as chair next year, and, um, or starting actually this month for this coming year. The Art and Wine Festival is returning to Heather Farm Park on June 1st and 2nd. Looks to be a, an exciting event, as always. And that's my chamber report. I did attend the Future of Walnut Creek with my other colleagues, and the mayor will speak. did a great job, as did our city manager and our police chief. And the, nice having representatives from Walnut Creek downtown and the Shadelands PBID talk about what's happening there as well. On the Recycle Smart Board that I serve along with Council Member Silva, the other item we discussed in addition to releasing the RFP was serv the service quality metric, which is uh, Recycle or Republic Services is our provider. And in order for them to get a rate increase, they need to do a good job. And in order for us to evaluate how they're doing a good job, we had been basing it on whether or not people had been calling into Republic or to the authority. That didn't seem like a good way to do it because it puts the burden on all of us. So instead, we're sh shifting to a missed pickups. It's a more objective measurement. We'll be able to tell what, how many people missed a pickup. If you missed a pickup, you'll automatically get a credit on your bill for that missed uh, pickup. And then we'll be able to um, kind of hold their feet to the fire and make sure that they're providing the service that we're expecting in order to evaluate any future rate increase. And then I too wanted to echo my sadness, but also appreciation for uh, Terry on a job very well done. It, uh, you know, single-handedly, I think you and Colette were responsible for the success of outdoor dining, which whenever we're out and about in the public, we, we showcase as a highlight of, of the COVID period and the pandemic and something good that came out of that. So, so thank you for that, for our economic development action plan that's going to live on that we're, we're imp actively implementing, and just for your positive attitude and the approach you brought to, to economic development. And, and on a personal note, it was fun to watch your daughter broadcast uh, local games at Las Lomas and see her be successful in her college career. So we will miss you and wish you the best. And to Steve Waymeyer, who I know is not at home watching, uh, I also want to express my appreciation. I've, I've been on council since 2018. And before that, on the Planning Commission, I didn't really have much opportunity to interact with Steve, but did interact with a lot of folks in engineering and, and public works. And just his, his encyclopedic knowledge of issues in Walnut Creek, the, the advice he gave us on some very important things, on big projects that came in recently on traffic improvements and drainage improvements. I really appreciated that. I'm sorry that we couldn't close it out with the pool complex, but I think we're, we're making progress there. And so I just wanted to, to thank Steve for all, he's, all that he's given to the city and, and he will be missed as well. And that's my report. Thank you. Uh, most of you took half of my report. Um, so uh, I did get to go to the opening, the official opening of the McCollumy Trail way out in Brentwood. It was um, under the auspices of Contra Costa Transportation Authority, and it links everything from way down here to way up there. Um, and it's, it's beside uh, being very practical, it's a beautiful bridge, and it goes over Highway 4, the extent, extension of that. Um, I, too, belong to a policy committee, Rev and Tax, um, and uh, we mostly pay attention to uh, where the money comes from and where it goes. And uh, we spent some time listening to the work that California is doing to transition from 
being able to afford uh, repairing and building our roads with the gas tax to what we're going to do as the structure of our vehicles changes. And uh, there was a long discussion on road fees. And, and essentially, it will be charged by mileage. Um, surprisingly, according to the speaker, um, it's not going to make a huge difference in our lives. Mostly, it's going to come within maybe $100 difference between for a year uh, between what we pay as gas tax for those of us that still use the old-fashioned cars and uh, what we would pay based on mileage. And given how much I drive, I'm going to make money. Um, so, um, and we also talked uh, about the long-standing project of the Rev and Tax Department, uh, thing, which the mayor is, excuse me, the city manager is uh, an active part. Um, we're trying to figure out a way as a, as an organization to um, st to stop the bleeding of uh, sales tax from our cities. Uh, because of the uh, distribution houses that have uh, landed in other cities and then the cities offer those distribution houses some refunds and all the sales tax goes to these cities instead of coming to us. So if you buy something in a Walnut Creek store, for example, um, you're a Walnut Creek resident, so you get a small teeny portion of the sales tax you, you pay for, it comes back to us. But if you buy something on Amazon, uh, we get almost none of that tax. And so we're trying to make it a little more equitable. It was fun. I got to be a server at the uh, senior meals for Meals on Wheels. Um, they take Meals on Wheels takes meals out to our seniors and, and people that can't get to it, um, but they also once a week have a place where the seniors can come in and uh, be served a full meal and have the conviviality of seeing one another. And uh, gosh, I felt like such a celebrity. It was pretty impressive. Um, and one little lady gave me a lottery ticket, and I hope it came with magic. It didn't. Um, <laughs> but it made me feel good. Um, and then finally, um, Diablo Ballet, who has been a longstanding performer in the theater, celebrated its 30th anniversary, and I got to present the proclamation, saved you from having to hear me read another, um, I got to present a proclamation at their ballet performance, and so it was a pleasure to see, and I swear to goodness they get better and better every time I see them. So that's the end of this, and we're now on to our public hearing. Um, so will the staff, or who's going to take, take over? The presentation will be made by Assistant City Attorney Ali Wolf this evening. Welcome. Thank you. Good evening, Mayor Haskew. I'll let a few there, there is a little yeah. recircle. Okay, I think it's okay to go. Good evening, Mayor Heskew, Mayor Potem Darling, and Council Members. My name is Allie Wolf, Assistant City Attorney, and I will be presenting um, an ordinance amendment to you this evening related to amplified sound. In April of 2022, this council adopted Chapter 16 of Title IV of the Walnut Creek Municipal Code, which was entitled Access to Reproductive Health Care Facilities. In March of 2023, the city amended the Access to Reproductive Health Care Facilities Ordinance to affirm the ordinance is based on specific rights protected by the U.S. Constitution and the, state of, the Constitution of the State of California. 
Chapter 4.16 currently provides a number of restrictions related to access to reproductive health care facilities, including a prohibition against approaching a person or a vehicle within eight feet when within 100 feet of a doorway entrance of a reproductive health care facility without the consent of that person for the purpose of harassing or intimidating that person, and a prohibition on obstructing access to or departure from any doorway entrance to a building or driveway of a reproductive health care facility. At the time of adoption, staff were also made aware of issues related to amplified sound around the Planned Parenthood facility located at 1357 Oakland Boulevard. And council directed staff to monitor the noise issue and conduct measurements of the disruptive noise in the area around Planned Parenthood. In November of 2021, the police department increased its patrols in the downtown area, including the area around Planned Parenthood to monitor the issues that arise related to protests. These patrols are now regular part of an officer's shift and the increased patrols can assist the police department in responding to any potential issues involving non-compliance with existing laws, including the uh, access to reproductive health care, municipal code, uh, chapter 4.16, as well as trespassing onto the parking lot at Planned Parenthood building or other reproductive health care facilities, obstruction of the sidewalk or driveway, as well as California Penal Code section 423.2, which relates to impeding access to a reproductive health care facility under state law. Between January 2020 and March of 2024, the police department received approximately 79 calls for service, which it determined to be protest related for incidences on and in front of the Planned Parenthood facility. Calls included calls for service regarding protest or obstruction of walkways, harassment, intimidation, and physical altercations, which all impact an individual's ability to access reproductive health care. Between 2020 and 2024, 11 of the calls for service to the police department identified disruptive noises made specifically by sound amplifying devices, including megaphones, loudspeakers, uh, bullhorns, and microphones. Planned Parenthood in Walnut Creek has also submitted a letter to the city uh, in May of 2023 with a summary of protest or incidences documented by their employees during their work shifts. Between April of 2022 and April of 2023, they documented 138 incidences with protesters at the Planned Parenthood facility, of which megaphones was mentioned 42 times during the date range and microphone was mentioned eight times during the date range. This letter also explained that the noise produced by protesters outside of the facility creates an excessive disturbance and can often be heard from inside of the exam rooms in the facility. Noise exposure in medical settings can create or exacerbate patient health issues and has been linked to increased levels of stress and anxiety, increased heart rate and higher blood pressure. Research studies conducted by academics and medical professionals show that there is evidence of negative physiological and mental health effects from noise in healthcare facilities, including decreases in overall well being and impacts on the process of recovery. The city of Sacramento recently adopted a restriction on sound amplifiers within 100 feet of the property line of a reproductive health care facility. And this evening, staff are recommending adoption of a similar restriction in the city by amending Chapter 4.16 to establish a restriction on the use of sound amplifiers within 100 feet of a doorway entrance to the facility located at 1357 Oakland Boulevard in Walnut Creek. Staff recommend limiting the restriction to this particular facility rather than all reproductive health care facilities in the city because staff are not aware of any ongoing amplified sound disruptions at other reproductive health 
care facilities in the city of Walnut Creek. Uh, staff also recommend the 100 foot distance be measured from a doorway entrance because staff anticipate this distance would be sufficient with the setup of the facility in Walnut Creek to reduce the negative impacts of noise from amplified sound devices around and inside of the facility. And that measurement of the 100 foot distance from a doorway entrance would also provide consistency with the uh, additional restrictions that are currently in place in chapter 4.16. Current case law does support the city's consideration of adoption of a regulation on amplified sound to help reduce the negative impacts of noise disruptions around a healthcare facility. A government entity may impose a restriction on the use of amplified sound around a healthcare facility so long as the restriction are, are the restrictions are content neutral, time, place, and manner regulations of speech, and narrowly tailored to serve a significant government interest. The proposed ordinance this evening, restricting the use of sound amplifiers around the facility in Walnut Creek at Planned Parenthood is a valid time, place, and manner restriction on speech that is content neutral. It would regulate the use of amplifi sound amplifiers within 100 feet of a doorway of a, of a doorway entrance. It does not target the message or the topic of speech. It only applies from one hour before until one hour after the reproductive health care facility is open. The proposed ordinance is also narrowly tailored to advance the city's substantial interest in protecting patients' rights to access to reproductive health care services. The use of sound amplifiers that can increase volume above that of a conversational speaking voice is incompatible with the normal activity of the reproductive health care facility. The normal activity of the facility includes the provision of medical and reproductive health care facilities and procedures. Sound amplifiers cause noise from the devices that reach inside of treatment rooms within the facility, and this noise can negatively affect the physiological and mental health of patients. The use of sound amplifying devices can be disturbing in such a sensitive setting where patients are receiving reproductive health care services and are often undergoing medical procedures. The proposed ordinance also leaves open ample alternative avenues of communication. It allows sound that is not altered by the use of sound amplifiers, including consensual conversations where there is an eight foot distance between the speaker and the target audience, or where there is more than an eight foot distance if the communication is non-consensual in accordance with the uh, chapter 4.16 currently in effect. The image that you have in, on this PowerPoint slide depicts the 100 foot radius from the two doorways at the uh, reproductive healthcare facility at 1357 Oakland Boulevard. The definition of entrance would establish that the person using the sound amplifier must be more than 100 feet away from the doorway entrance that is closest to them. So you can see there are two doorways that are depicted on this image, um, and the radius reaches 100 feet from that doorway entrance. The ordinance establishes enforcement criteria to include a criminal and civil enforcement avenue for violation. Criminal enforcement allows the city to uh, cite violators as misdemeanor offenses, and civil enforcement allows an aggrieved person to bring a private action in civil court to enforce a violation. The recommended action this evening for council to consider um, is after accepting public testimony and if council desires to proceed with the ordinance to waive the first reading and introduce uh, the ordinance amending chapter 16 of title four of the municipal code to establish a restriction on the use of sound amplifiers around the reproductive healthcare facility located at 1357 Oakland Boulevard. I'm available to answer any questions that council may have this evening. 
Okay, are there any questions from council? Yes, um, Cindy, please. Thank you very much um, for the clarity, for explaining that we're talking about the entrance doors, not the property lines, and also for showing the diagram as to what's in the circumference of the 100 feet. How can we make it easy for those who are seeking to partake of the services as well as those who are seeking to exercise their freedom of speech to know where the 100 foot marker is? Can we paint the sidewalks? Can we put up signs? Something that just makes it easy to understand. So I have spoken with public work staff about what options there are to indicate the distance from the 100 foot distance from the facility doorway. Um, there are options to potentially put up a sign. There may also be the option of depicting or painting some sort of line or indication on the ground on the sidewalks. And public work staff will look into what those options are and ensure that there's um, some path forward to clearly indicate since it's not a straight line, but it's a curve with a sidewalk that's curving, if we agree to do this, painting may be the easiest way to sh depict it. Thank you. Matt. Thank you. Thank you, Allie. Uh, in terms of the Sacramento ordinance, which I think ours, this is based on, uh, that was from the property line, and we're choosing to do it from the door. And can you just elaborate? on why the distinction there? Yeah, so many of the Planned Parenthood facilities are set up differently. Um, we found when we were uh, looking into the original adoption of Chapter 4.16, uh, which established the restriction on harassing or intimidating conduct within 100 feet, that the 100 foot uh, buffer essentially what would be sufficient around the facility um, and what we anticipate this would allow, what was being proposed this evening would allow consistency with that original ordinance. And also the 100 feet, as you can see on the image and the depiction is, is quite a far distance away from the entrance, considering the parking lot um, and kind of landscaping area in between the facility and the um, sidewalk and street. Okay, that, that's, so it's, it, it's, it's generally consistent with the ordinance we have now with the buffer zone in terms of that 100, 100 foot area where you the speech is restricted with the eight foot buffer zone is that that's right? correct and and the map that you showed I don't believe there would be all really it wouldn't be all that much different between the easternmost door and the property line measuring <laughs> the hundred foot from they're pretty close there didn't doesn't seem to be a significant difference yes okay and then the, the other question I had was on enforcement I know that we've increased patrols in that area and so maybe Captain Hibbs can talk a little bit about kind of bo both uh, civil and criminal enforcement of the ordinance that is on the books now and then how this new amendment might be enforced uh, good evening members of the City Council members of the public city staff Ryan Hibbs Walnut Creek Police Operations Captain um, what was your question? So in enforcement, Captain, just in terms of kind of what's happening now and then any cons issues or concerns with the amendment and how the police department would enforce that? No, in fact, uh, this would be very easy to enforce from a... From a would, would you lean into the micro... It's, the voice is here. Uh, would you lean into the microphone because it's hard to hear Is you. that better? I'm sorry. Uh, this would be very easy to enforce from a police department standpoint. Okay, and and have just you've increased patrols in the area. I understand we have, and uh, just has that presence had a, a positive effect in your opinion from kind of reducing incidents around the facility? We believe so. Yes. Okay. That's all my questions. Thank you. Okay, uh, Kevin, please. Thank you. I just have one question right now. I might have more after we hear from public comment, but. Uh, uh, Ali had mentioned that most of the complaints were from parent, Planned Parenthood. Have there been other complaints from outside Planned Parenthood, whether it's businesses or residences that you're aware of? Yes, there have been. We've had, uh, we've had a few complaints uh, in regard to noise from some of the residents in the area. But, okay, thank you. Thank you, and thank you for both of 
for working on this. Um, and I'm not sure if this is an Allie or Ryan question, but have we talked to Sacramento to see how um, they've been, you know, since this is modeled on their ordinance, have we talked to them about what they've been seeing? That's an Allie question. <laughs> <laughs> Happily. Um, yes, I have spoken with the deputy city attorney who worked on the ordinance adoption in Sacramento. They have, this was, the ordinance was only adopted a few months ago. Um, they haven't, or a number of months ago. Um, as far as the attorney was aware we spoke with, they haven't inf had to enforce it. They haven't seen um, a significant issue at this point with enforcement of the ordinance, but at the same time, they have not actually cited to that ordinance at this okay. time. Thank you. I don't have a question. Um, I notice people are getting a little restless. So um, we will take a 10 minute um, break and, and then we'll um, take public comment when, when we come back.
Okay, everyone, time to take your seats. Okay, please get your seats, and if you haven't handed in a yellow card uh, for speaking, uh, please do that now. The yellow cards are up at the by the door. Thank you. I guess we're on. Are we on? Are we on? We're on. Okay. All right. It is now time for the public comments. And uh, would you line up at the podium, maybe four or five at a time? And when the line gets really short, then next people can line up. I have eight speaker cards. Has anybody not given us a speaker card? Okay. A couple of people. Yeah. When it gets to be four, um, I don't. I don't want to be calling by names, but when it gets to be four, maybe you, you shouldn't just congregate. Maybe you can just make sure the line gets smaller. Okay. All right. Should I give these to you? Um, over there, please. Thank you. All right. All right. Uh, first speaker, please step forward. Give us your name and your. Um, city of residence, and and uh, you're going to need to move the microphone <laughs> down. <laughs> you're like me; you're short. You're very yeah. short. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Is that okay? Okay, that's great. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. My name is Sandy Fink. I live in Alamo, and I'm a volunteer at Planned Parenthood in Walnut Creek. And every single day that I've been there, there are people there with microphones. Usually, at least two, up to four. I have recordings I would like to play for you that show how loud it is compared to the ambient noise. I am 40 to 50 people, 50 feet away from these people. And I have several of them. I won't play the whole thing because they go on for a long time. Compare that to the ambient noise. This one is directed at me because they overheard my name. Personal remarks I find offensive. So that's just some examples of the kinds of things that are said, personally addressed to us, to the people who work there, to the people who are coming for care. Please pass this. This is for the benefit of the people who live in that area, for the businesses nearby. They stand in the driveway of the next building over, 1371, because there's a walkway into Planned Parenthood there. So they stand in their driveway so, so they can get closer to the door of Planned Parenthood. Thank you. Reverend Dr. Victoria Rue. I'm an ordained Roman Catholic woman priest. Along with 250 other women across the world, we have taken the step as a matter of conscience. The primacy of conscience is an important teaching in the Catholic Church. One of my many ministries is to accompany women who are following their conscience and coming to Planned Parenthood, taking care of themselves, whether it is for STI testing and treatment, birth control, 
family planning services. When I hear people on loudspeakers say, Jesus loves you, I can agree. When I hear people say, you're going against God's will, or you're going to hell, or for whatever you're doing, you're going to hell in there. As women emerge from their cars and go into the clinic, this is a lie. Due to the unconscionable position of my church on birth control, abortion, and women's ordination, in good conscience, I must stand up and support these women, these people who are following their conscience who come to Planned Parenthood. Women who come to Planned Parenthood can be already in a fragile state. They have made a difficult decision to have a child or not to have a child. They can be already in the midst of economic pressures, marriage issues, domestic violence, whatever it is. They do not need the haranguing of men and women shouting into microphones. They do not need to sit in the lobby of Planned Parenthood with a TV that is turned up loud so as not to hear the haranguing from these people on the sidewalk who are on blaring speakers that pierce the walls of the waiting room. This amplification is not only intrusive, it causes even more suffering to the women and men who come to the clinic for help. The ampli amplification of things like they murder babies here, imagine uh, hearing that sorry, in the sorry. lobby of the clinic. Thank you. Next speaker, please. My name is Reverend Dr. Joanna Trulson. I too am a Roman Catholic woman priest, and I live at Rossmore, where I, uh, my sister priest lives also. Um, and what we do together is we have reproductive justice as one of our missions. So we both joined uh, Planned Parenthood to escort women to get the care they needed. Very unfortunately, when I first started and heard what was going on and saw, and even saw people that I knew from the, our community, it was, it was very scary. But I'm gonna relate one incident that happened when I was there shortly. A woman drove up, got out of her car, and we approached her, as we always do, to ask her, she has an appointment, can we help and escort her to the door? which I did, um, and she was in a hurry. So she was in there not very long and came out, and she said, they can't help me, they can't help me. And I said, are you okay? What can I do to help you? She said, I was at San Ramon Planned Parenthood, they couldn't help me, and now we ca they can't help me here. So I was very surprised. So I walked her to her car, I said, you know, I'm not sure what's going on, but let's, let's get you someplace where you can be helped. She drove to the, the curb, and her, her window was down, and apparently she was engaging with the people on the sidewalk, and she said to them, they can't help me because I have an eptopic pregnancy. And all I could hear was in the background saying, well, save the baby, save the baby. I'm an, I'm an RN also, and I know there's no saving the baby when you have an eptopic pregnancy. So I just wanted you to know this. Thank you very much. Next speaker, please. Good evening. I'm Robin Papano Kuntz. I live in Antioch, and I'm a weekly volunteer um, escort at Walnut Creek Planned Parenthood. I've been doing it for several years, and I strongly support a sound ordinance. Um, three or four protesters at a time have voice amplifiers they use to talk to the clients and their supporters entering and leaving the health center. There is some traffic noise, but it's nothing compared to the loudness of the amplified voices. Many times I've been inside the health center checking in for my shift and a protester with voice amplification was so loud I could hear it inside the health center with the door closed. That should not be allowed to continue to happen. And like the woman who spoke before me, I had a, a really upsetting occurrence a couple weeks ago and I, and I see a lot, I've been there a long time and it's annoying, but this one really hurt. There was a young couple who came in 
and they, they got the usual speech, you know, they murder babies in there, and, and she said, I lost my pregnancy. It's, it's my pregnant, my baby's dead. And they kept talking to her, and she and her partner were so upset. I was really afraid that the young man was gonna go out and um, you know, get violent, but he, he kept calm. He went to his car and played, <laughs> played some loud music, and, and he calmed down. But it was really, really sad and, and upsetting to me. And I just wanna be clear that I feel protesters have a right to voice their opinions, but not with voice amplification. Next speaker, please. Good evening, members of the City Council. My name is Rabbi Jill Perlman. I live in Moraga, and I serve as the Senior Rabbi of Temple Isaiah, where several members of our, many members of our community uh, reside here in Walnut Creek. I applaud our loving interfaith community who was here early, earlier to speak up for the type of community we all deserve, one full of love rather than hate, and to speak up against anti-Semitism. However, I want to use my time tonight to speak on this issue. I serve on the steering committee for clergy for reproductive freedom, and I stand today to ask for your support to add that noise provision to the existing buffer zone ordinance outside of the Planned Parenthood Health Center. Regularly, protesters come with these megaphones and microphones microphones to verbally harass staff and patients. No one deserves to be treated that way, and we need your support to ensure that their safety is not compromised and that they are treated with decency and with respect. With no noise provision in place in the existing buffer zone, protesters have used this amplified sound to normalize their harassment of not just patients and staff, but of the surrounding neighbors and businesses. For the safety of our community, a noise buffer zone is necessary to prevent protesters from creating a dangerous environment. There loud displays distract nearby drivers and create a difficult environment for our local businesses. This is an issue of public safety and as a religious leader in the community I am also deeply concerned about the degradation of human dignity that is being allowed through this continued harassment. I also suffered an ectopic pregnancy so this is a very personal issue for me. We here, you here, have the opportunity to create a model policy here in Walnut Creek that lifts up human dignity and public safety while also protecting essential health care. Given the current political climate related to abortion and reproductive health care services, it is essential that we protect those who are using the health care center by putting this noise provision into place. Thank you. All right. We could maybe have some more people line up, and then the next paper, please come forward. Should I give my card to someone? Uh, my name is Patty Ellis. I live in Danville, and I'm a new volunteer with Planned Parenthood in Walnut Creek. And I have recently experienced, in the few times that I've even been volunteering, I personally have been yelled at uh, with a megaphone and amplifier that I was homosexual. And I can only imagine what the clients that are walk going into this clinic who are making very difficult decisions on one hand and yet on the other hand, I experienced a time where this woman was coming into the parking lot. She had her window down. A gentleman walked up to her car, started talking and engaging with her. I walked up to her. I got in between him and her, and she was very upset, and she said, I don't, he doesn't even know why I'm here. She said, I'm here to get an ultrasound for my baby. So he said to me, I'm talking to her, and I said, no, I'm talking to her now. And that's all I have to say. Thank you. Next speaker, please, and, and if you want to say something, the line is very short right now. Okay. Good evening, Mayor and members of the council. My name's Elizabeth Rust, and I live in Walnut Creek. I am a patient escort volunteer at the Walnut Creek Planned Parenthood. I've been there for two years, and during those two years, protesters have routinely used voice augmenting devices. They've also routinely used inflammatory statements that border on vile. And um, it's very clear that everybody understands that these statements can be heard via devices outside of the clinic. I've been concerned about how well they could be heard inside the clinic. And at times I've gone into the clinic even with the television on, and you can hear it even though it's muffled. On March 8th, um, the television was not on, and the um, protesters are using 
voice augmenting devices and saying horrible things. I went into the clinic because I wanted to see how loud it was. You could hear everything that was being said loud and clear. One of the other volunteers from outside the clinic videotaped this diatribe and um, I can guarantee you, I believe that's been sent to you. If you listen to that March 8th video, everything that you hear on that video is what patients could hear inside while they were there for a medical appointment. Hello, my name is Kathy Dunn and I live not far from Planned Parenthood and I think Planned Parenthood is a great resource for our community. Um, and when I, I have to drive by that location several times a week for various uh, chores that I do to get on Highway 24, and it's very disturbing to have to listen to these amplified sounds of uh, people trashing the women who are there and, and making comments about how they're not religious and how they're killing their babies. And I get to the point where I try to go in other directions because I can't stand going by Planned Parenthood and hearing this harassment of these women who are just seeking their health care. Uh, I see people, uh, protesters, blocking the driveway and, and constantly harassing the women. I find it very upsetting, and I hope you pass this amendment. I think it's very important for the community. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Uh, Mayor and council people, um, my name is Rand Critton. I live in Lafayette. Um, I am part of, I know a lot of you from being the lead uh, for the cleanup committee, or cleanup crew for, for uh, Karen Mariner and the rest of you, and I've had the opportunity to meet you there. I've also been a Planned Parenthood escort uh, since before COVID. And it's actually sort of ironic in the sense my dad was also in a Planned Parenthood escort here in Walnut Creek, and he's been dead over 15 years, so that shows how long it's been. One of the things that you, that I really appreciate your city attorney setting out is that this is a, a motion about amplified sound, and limiting amplified sound is not limiting free speech, and that's what Justice Reinquist said back in 1994 in, the, in one of the uh, cases that were cited here. But amplified sound attacks people, and that's what has happened here. The amplified sound is attacking the patients that are coming in and the clients that have come in. Um, it allows them to call them murderers. It allows them to target people that are inherently fragile at a time that is very, very difficult for them. Amplified sound allows them to target the partners of the people that are coming in and calling them names and inciting them to do things that they have their GoPro cameras on so they can get the idea of being able to see things. Amplified sound allows them to target the workers and the doctors that are there. They Over and over you hear them saying to the doctors um, about how they're sacrificing and how they've got blood money. These are the amplified sounds that come out of there. The amplified sound allows them to target the people inside the building as you've been hearing that. So your ordinance targets amplified sound, not free speech. Next speaker, please. Good evening, honorable magistrates. My name is Sophia Martin. Thank you very much for the opportunity to speak with you all this evening. Initially, I attended the buffer zone meetings. At that time, you graciously heard our comments and although you decided in favor of the buffer zone, you agreed to table the proposed noise ordinance level as the recommended 60 decibel level was very low. You said you would conduct an investigation on sound decibel levels at Planned Parenthood. My question to you tonight is, did you conduct the investigation and determine a decibel level? And if not, will you? I've had the privilege of counseling 24 moms to choose life. All of this was made possible partly because they could hear me. 
The noise from the freeway coupled with the clinic escorts aggressively interfering and in us inviting a mom into a conversation on the sidewalk in front of Planned Parenthood makes it close to impossible for us to exercise our First Amendment rights. We are not using bullhorns. We are using sound amplifiers. I do admit that since there was no final noise level determined, we have not had a specific level we followed. I've downloaded a decibel reader app on my phone and will happily agree to stay within the decibel level you see fit. Next, you will hear from one of our moms who chose life for our baby. We are not protesters. We are the church of the living God, the maker of heaven and earth, the one who knits us together in our mother's womb. It's not our desire to be activists, but to be the church of Jesus Christ to moms in need like my friend Lily. We don't leave at the end of the day and forget the moms we serve. We love them and walk with them well past the day their baby is born. Please don't take away the ability for moms like Lily to receive the help and hope they so greatly need by taking away our ability to be heard. Thank you. D did you give us your name at the beginning? Sophia Martin. Thank, Thank you. you. I'm sorry I missed it. <clears throat> City Council. Hi, my name is Lily, and I'm just wanting to say something from my heart and be a voice today for moms in the same situation I once faced. When I th thought I was pregnant, I went to Planned Parenthood because I was scared. I was planning to get an abortion. I met sidewalk counselors outside of Planned Parenthood, and they were so kind to me. I felt warm inside and they just very comfortable. When I shared my situation, Sophia comforted me and helped me have the courage to choose life for my baby. I was searching for help and hope, and I found that with Love Life. They supported me throughout my pregnancy and made sure I was okay. Now my daughter is my whole world and I can't imagine my life without her. My daughter was God's plan for me and I know <clears throat> and I know even now that if I need help, love life will be there for me. Next speaker, please. Hi, my name is uh, Michael Vecchiel, resident of Walnut Creek. Um, the only bad thing about the ordinance in my mind is that it just has to be done. Um, you have to spend your time doing this. Your staff has to spend their time doing this. All these volunteers get affected. Um, the women going there for reproductive health care have to be affected, and I think that's a shame. Um, so I just want to talk about a couple of specifics, and I think some of the th items are raised, and I was happy to hear them, like the uh, definition of entrance. Um, is it the driveway entrance or the, the uh, door into the building? I'm glad that's been... Um, uh, resolved. A question I have is what if Planned Parenthood moves to another location? Do you have to have another ordinance for that specific location or can something be written uh, in general terms to address all possible future locations? Um, I think it's also important that Public Works and the Police Department will work together to somehow delineate where this 100-foot line is so that it's clear to the activists there trying to promote their views as well as the police trying to enforce them um, can all be clear on what's, what's what. I think that's really uh, important. The last comment is that um, you know a lot of free speech issues um, and speech seems to focus on words and you know what I'm saying right now, but uh, the graphic images that are presented on the posters there, to me that's, that's a form of speech. Um, it's also very intimidating to see those graphic images, whether you're driving by and you see a poster that's three feet wide and four feet tall with dismembered babies and things like that. I think that's a horrible thing. Um, too bad something can't be done about that type of uh, intimidation. So uh, thank you for your time. Next speaker, please. I'm Jonathan Martin. Good evening, distinguished members of the Walnut Creek City Council. Abortion is a very serious issue and the number one cause of death in the United States. I did not take this issue very seriously until I visited Sidewalk of Planned Parenthood. I was touched by the loss of life inside the clinic. The word of God says we are knit together in our mother's wombs. This is why many Christians take this issue very seriously. I know that there's been reported disturbance in front of Planned Parenthood in Walnut Creek. I 
had the opportunity to witness training for the sidewalk counseling for an organization called Love Life. Counselors were taught to plead with moms, but not harass or intimidate them, as it has been reported. We were taught to show the same kindness to moms before and after they had planned, enter Planned Parenthood with no condemnation. Counselors were taught to not to obstruct driveways, walkways, and were taught to approach only upon consent. Because of the seriousness of abortion is my belief that sound amplification should be allowed so that women can hear the hope and help that can be offered to them. It is important to note in your agenda report that when the Walnut Creek police officers responded to multiple calls that they could not independently observe and verify noise disruptions. Again, I believe that some, again, I believe that amplification of some level should be allowed so that it can be heard by those walking in. Thank you kindly for your time. Next speaker, please. My name is Phyllis Rizzuto, and I just want to thank you for this opportunity to be, to be able to speak. I just want to say that I'm here because it's incredibly sad to see women walking up to terminate what they think is the problem in their life. I see them walking up, and they're so broken and crying a lot of the time. I have empathy for them because around 40 years ago, I did the same thing. I had an abortion about 40 years ago, and there wasn't anybody reaching out to me. I just went through it and then buried it for a long time. So I go to try to intervene for these babies' lives, to try to reach out and to come alongside the women and offer real hope and to walk with them. So I hope that we will be able to keep using the small amplifier because of the traffic. It is so, because the traffic is so loud, we want them to be able to hear us and about the hope that we have to offer. Thank you for your time. Next speaker, please. <clears throat> Respected council members and city staff, thank you for the opportunity to share tonight. My name is Haley Bialy, and I'm here in humble opposition to the proposed ordinance. I understand this is a contentious issue, so I only kindly ask that your ears be open to hearing another perspective than that of the reports you've heard. Here's my perspective. There are many voices to advocate for people to come for an abortion, but few to advocate for these same people to get the help that would prevent them from feeling that abortion is their best option. Those in front of Planned Parenthood stand in the gap not only for the child, but for the mothers and fathers to offer, offer practical resources such as food, housing, childcare, and mentorship. They do not protest or condemn, but peaceably offer help and support. Unplanned pregnancy, although it shouldn't be a cause for shame, does cause shame in many women. Therefore, they don't tell others about their lack of resources or confidence. So, those needs never get met, unless someone reaches out in the only place they know they can find them, at the abortion center. When a mother goes for an abortion, besides taking away the burden of a child, Planned Parenthood offers no help with the practicals of life. I've often seen more brokenness on the faces of those leaving the abortion center than on, than on those I saw going in. I understand the desire for Planned Parenthood staff to have their space, but I also fear the slippery slope of this ordinance leading to further silencing of the voices offering support and alternative solutions. My request of you today, council members, before you vote in favor of this ordinance, is to take an hour out of your workday to visit the front of Planned Parenthood to observe what goes on, to make a fair and thorough assessment before enacting a new law. If you do move forward with your vote today, I still invite you to come out. With this experience and future decisions, you will have the whole picture. If you have already visited, I thank you for your dedication to a fair and thorough assessment. Thank you. Hi, my name is Ed Case. Should I speak into the mic? Yeah, please. So that everybody may hear? Yeah, better, better so than talking to nobody, people, yes. So that the value people here may be able to hear what I say. And that's what we do with Planned Parenthood. We speak into a mic so that the value people going in and there could hear what we say. The traffic in the back, it's been noted already. 
it is loud. We can barely even hear each other talk from from one, one station to the other for where we put ourselves. We can barely even hear each other. Not only do we use them for that, but we also use them because we have other escorts that are mumbling into the ears of those that are going in. And we have no opportunity to give them the hope and the help that we offer, the resources and the hope and the help that we offer. So that's why we use the microphones. That's why we use them so that they can hear and have an opportunity and an option to choose the right thing at the right time. There's some women in there and men that go in there. It's we're value of the whole family. They go in there and some are not gonna listen to us, but some are. And if they don't hear what we have to offer, how are they gonna be able to make their conscious choice to choose life for their baby? And so that is the reasons why we use these amplified. I go to other clinics and I don't use an amplified voice there because I don't have to. You know why? Because my voice is heard. Walnut Creek and with all that goes on in the background, it's so loud, so loud, even if I was going to scream out to them without the microphone, with the microphone, they, they barely hear. Now, if I was going to scream at them without a microphone, they're going to be looking at me like I'm yelling at them, like I'm a madman and crazy. With that, it's clear and precise. We're not screaming. We're not yelling. They're able to hear what we have to say, and that is the reasons why we use those amplified mics. And so I hope you guys ain't predetermined in your decision and you really, really take this into account so that women have a choice to choose life or not for themselves. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Good evening, council members. My name is Christian Garcia, vice president of government relations and communications for Planned Parenthood in Northern California. Very long title. Um, I am here this evening not necessarily to speak on my behalf, but I'm speaking on behalf of one of our clinicians in Wana Creek. Um, she wanted to be here, but out of protection of her name and privacy, we wanted to keep her um, away. Uh, but she did write this statement. Dear council members, the protesters are persistent in an ongoing problem for our patients. We have patients regularly present for a full spectrum of healthcare services, not just abortion care. And from the start of their visit, many of them are upset because of the interactions that they've encountered on their way in. Already, they are more hesitant to share their healthcare needs with us because they have been publicly shamed. The protester activity can be easily heard inside the clinic, in the rooms, as we are trying to interact with the patients. What is, should be a private moment is constantly interrupted by the protesters outside. The protesters particularly target patients of color and our staff reminding them of all the negative reasons why they should not work there or they should not go into our health center. While our staff is resilient and provides excellent care, they still do not deserve to be treated this way. The amplified sound that the protesters use creates a clear voice and demonstrated in the videos provided to this council that nobody should, be a, should enter a hostile environment for a patient, for a healthcare visit or to be at work. So that's on behalf of all of our clinicians. The other thing that I want to say is that this is an issue not just in Wana Creek, but we are seeing more and more of these protesters going to other health centers in Concord, San Francisco, Chico. Um, and so what you do here tonight is going to be a great example of what other communities could do at the local level to protect patient services. So thank you. Is there anybody else who wishes to make public comment at this time? If so, please fill out a yellow card and step forward. I'm not seeing anybody additionally, so I'm gonna bring it back to count. Oh, okay, thank you. My name is Heather Lowe. I've just a, a comment to make. There are plenty of advocates out there for women's health, health care. There are very few advocates for the life of the unborn child. A child that is going to be terminated, have his life terminated and never reach his fullest potential. And we're making a huge decision, put, placing ourselves on as God, whether those children should be terminated. It's not up to us. 
it's after God Almighty. It's his child, made in his image, in his womb. What right do we have to take the life of an unborn child? What right? Thank you, council members. I truly appreciate your listening to us, but thank you. Okay, final call. Anybody want to step forward? Seeing nobody, we're going to bring it back to council. Um, just closing public comment and then bringing it back to council. Thought that was the same thing. Anyhow, uh, here we are. We're back at council. Uh, what would anybody have additional questions? Anybody have additional comments? Um, I have a couple of additional questions. I appreciated the clarification earlier on that it's the doorways and there are two doorways. Um, I also appreciated the clarification that it creates basically two circles that merge with each other because they're overlapping and that we can figure out a way to demarcate it clearly so that people have a clear understanding if we should choose to do this. Uh, that's correct. That's uh, based on the conversations that Allie had with uh, public works staff. We think we could do that. Um, we would need to evaluate the site, though, just to make sure and can report back to the council. Uh, if it goes into the street, does that make a difference? It, it actually will cover a portion of the street, but we would uh, we want to have a conversation with public works about that. We had thought that better to mark on sidewalk areas uh, because we don't want to create an impression that people should stand in the streets of any sort there, so. Do so at your own risk. <laughs> so we had a few questions from, I think it was Mr. Vecchio, uh, for clarification on the, the doorway. And I know there's some changes on the dais here. Can you? Explain those for us, Allie. The original language had said no use of sound amplifiers within 100 feet of an entrance, and now it says 100 feet of a doorway entrance. Yeah. But we're defining entrance as a doorway entrance that is closest to the person. Yes, yeah, so the, the intent was just to clarify. There had been some questions about what entrance we were talking about in the ordinance. Okay. Um, and so it's meant to just clarify that it is in fact a doorway entrance. I'm familiar, I, I have been to the, the clinic and I'm familiar with the main entrance doorway and there's a second uh, doorway apparently. Yes. Closer to the street. There, so there, the doorway, that, that that's the main entrance, is closest to the street. Okay. And then there's a separate doorway that's farther back in the parking lot. The intention and the definition would indicate um, that the doorway that is being measured, the 100 feet, would be the doorway that's closest to the person speaking or using a sound amplifier. Understood. So for this clinic, there are two doorways? Correct. Two doorway entrances? Correct. Okay. And we talked about the 100 foot line and how that could be uh, there could be signage or it could be marked on the sidewalk, so I think we've addressed that one already. What about if the clinic were to move to a new facility? So the ordinance is specific. Generally, um, how we adopt ordinances is specific to property, not to an individual business. So if the Planned Parenthood facility moved and there were, were continued to be issues related to the new facility, then um, the city council, we could come back before the city council with consideration of a separate ordinance to address that issue. That makes sense. And then one of the questions that was raised, I think by Ms. Martin was, there was some talk about measuring decibel levels originally, and this ordinance does not reflect or put a cap on decibel levels, it looks at amplified noise. And can you explain a little bit about the thought process there? So this ordinance was specifically uh, uh, dr drafted based on the template of the Sacramento ordinance, which is already in place. Um, there was a prior version of the of a noise restriction in front of the council a number of years ago. Um, the in that circumstance, the noise was la any kind of loud 
or amplified sound. So it was across the board of any kind of sound. Um, with this ordinance, it would just be specific to amplified sound um, because of the impacts of amplified sounds. And um, at, at any degree, there, there could be an impact. So this was intentional to restrict amplified sound, not at a specific decibel level. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, Allie. <clears throat> I have a question. I'm not sure if it would be you or Captain Hibbs, so I'll just ask it, and then you guys will figure it out here. Uh, we heard from a few people, both volunteers as well as some of the protesters, that said that people came up to patients in their car to talk with them. I want to ask, that sounds like it's within the eight-foot buffer zone that we had established almost two years ago. Uh, would that be considered an infringement and um, not a not allowed based on our ordinance. I mean, we, we heard that from both escorts as well as from uh, protesters. So as the ordinance is currently drafted or currently in place, non-consensual confronting someone with the coming in within eight feet of someone when that contact is non-consensual with the uh, intent to intimidate or harass is in violation of the ordinance. Um, so yes, there would have to be a request to have a conversation prior to approaching someone with that intent. At the, at the car. Okay. Thank you. I don't have any, I don't have any additional questions. So I guess the time has come. Anybody want to make a comment first? Kevin. I'll start. How about that? <laughs> thank you. I uh, want to thank everyone for coming. This is something that we certainly see in the news on a national level, uh, and of course we've had to deal with here on the local level as well. We discussed including this in the original ordinance as we heard from um, Ms. Martin earlier, but gave the buffer zone ordinance time to be implemented and see if the protesters abided by that or would try to somehow skirt the ordinance taking and using other methods like noise. Over the last two years, We've seen repeated uncivil behavior by protesters trying to disrupt doctors, disrupt nurses, patients who are attempting to exercise their rights under California state law. Over the last nine months, I've gone to pa Planned Parenthood Clinic a few times, and in fact, Ms. Ms. Bialy had mentioned, come on down. I've, I've been down for over an hour on a few different occasions to see for myself and get an idea of what's going on there. What I've seen before people realize who I am is, in, it is blocking the, when people pass, even on cars, signs that are being shown at them, really v with vile pictures. When somebody pulls into the driveway or, or is walking by, they are immediately spoken to by people that are there. Now that is a freedom of speech, but if they're within eight feet, as we, as we just heard, that now is against the ordinance. Uh, in addition, I, it, it is, there is an intimidation factor there. You've got at least five or six people that are protesters right there. There is only one entrance in. I mean, there's a little bit of a side sidewalk, but you've got the driveway. Almost everybody's going to use the driveway, of course, especially if they're being driven in by, uh, by somebody who is a friend or family member. And it's intimidating. It's probably the worst day in somebody's life. And some of these people are not the ages of people that are in this room. Some of these people, as I've heard from nurses and volunteers, are young teenagers that have come from out of state because their states have now outlawed the ability to have reproductive services and even discussions. And thankfully, Walnut Creek is allowed to be able to, and California has made this right something that they can come to. Now, again, this is not about freedom of speech, but when these people are coming and coming into this area and are being hit with megaphones and microphones with speakers on their hips, and they've got the microphones just attached to their head, they are easily heard through car windows. How do I know this? Because I was at least 50 feet away on the other side of the street 
behind these people who were focusing their speakers towards the doors of the clinic, and I could hear them clear as a bell 50 feet away behind them. Yes, I heard ambient noise on the freeway, but there was no mistaking what was being said. And I am sure, of course, that those same words are being heard easily and loudly inside the clinic walls as well, upsetting patients and preventing doctors and nurses from being able to do their job and allowing somebody to exercise their state rights. Protesters at Planned Parenthood, as I have seen, are now pushing every boundary because they think they can get away with it, because they don't respect the rights of patients even when they're behind closed doors. And we, again, have heard from many of these escorts and many of the workers there how young some of these people are, these people that are making personal choices about their own health care needs. I wholeheartedly support this amendment for, to our ordinance. Matt, you're next. Thank you, Mayor. I um, appreciate everyone coming out tonight. Uh, I also appreciate the diligent work of our police department for the patrols that they've been doing in the area, for Planned Parenthood, for letting us know what's going on when we did adopt the buffer zone ordinance uh, two years ago and put a pause on the noise issue. It was because we wanted to give the buffer ordinance an opportunity to be implemented. We wanted to gather more information. And to me, it really seems like this amplified noise is being used as an end run around the buffer zone, that you, you have a right to uh, be free from non-consensual intimidation or harassment, but if someone has a megaphone or a microphone, all of a sudden you've lost that right. And so this is, to me, adopting this amendment is very consistent with what we did when we adopted the buffer zone. Um, it didn't need to be this way, but the, the reports that we've gotten from the police department that are cited in the Planned Parenthood letter, 40, about 40% 40 of the the, uh, the incidents relate to noise. I appreciated our city attorney talking about uh, how this was narrowly tailored and does leave alternative channels of communication. Um, I think it provides clear lines in terms of where this type of speech is allowed and where it's not. And I think we're undermining our buffer zone by not taking this step. And uh, I'll just go back. I know when we we originally heard this matter two years ago and reading some of the Supreme Court cases and Ninth Circuit Court cases dealing with this issue is that it still does allow for freedom of speech and that it, and that it was carefully drawn so that you know the, peop the people that are having a conversational uh, approach with someone trying to talk to them about a very sensitive issue can still do that. It doesn't allow for someone to use a microphone or a, a bullhorn in a threat, what I view as a threatening manner. So I think it, the, the, the empirical evidence is showing us that we need to take this step and I'm prepared to support the amendment. Cindy Silva. Um, I too appreciate everyone um, spending their evening with us and appreciate the comments and the thoughtful points of view. So right after we adopted the ordinance two years ago, actually I'll, I'll say it this way, I pr probably walked downtown and around downtown six days a week. And sometimes my walking partner and I go over to Oakland Boulevard to see what's happening at eight o'clock in the morning. First of all, I will tell you that is the most, if there's going to be traffic noise, that's when it will be. My walking partner and I can walk side by side with each other, not you know, this distance and have a normal conversation. The traffic noise does not impair the ability to have a normal conversation if you want that person to talk to you. But it was not two weeks after we adopted the ordinance when we were walking and noticed that 75 feet from the facility was a man yelling into a bullhorn. And it was like, we had basically said this was our concern, was that we were going to have to turn around and come back on this. And it was there. 
So I agree with you, Council Member Francois and Council Member Wilk, that this is an unfortunate necessity, but it doesn't preclude free speech and the right to have a cons consenting conversation. Um, recently, I also noticed, and I actually made a phone call to the police department, that there were 40 people out there. This is not a grocery store with 40 people going in every 10 minutes. This probably has a patient every 10 to 15 minutes. You don't need that many people if you want to have a consensual conversation with them. What you're doing by gang, you're ganging up on people and then you're yelling at them at the same time. I'm getting started, so I'm going to start yelling myself and I don't want to do that because I think I have said my piece. And I, too, thank everybody for coming out tonight and sharing your views with us. This is obviously an issue that we take very, very seriously. Um, in April of 2020, when we came up with the, ador the ordinance with the buffer zone, I was really hopeful that we'd crafted a solution that allowed protesters their First Amendment right and allowed them to have those quiet conversations that they said they wanted to have with um, people that were accessing Planned Parenthood. And I also wanted to make sure that we had ensured the safety of the people coming in there. I mean, things have gotten more dramatic since then. You know, not long after we adopted that ordinance was when um, the Supreme Court threw out Roe v. Wade and, you know, the, the issue became a national hot button. Um, but it is still the law of the land in California. In November 2020, two-thirds of the people in California approved Prop 1, which explicitly protected reproductive freedom. So what's been going on since 2020? Like Councilmember Silva, I work out not far from there, and I go by on a regular basis, and I look like an old lady that's kind of sweaty. And So I've been able to see what's been going on. Um, and a lot of times what I'm seeing are not the quiet offers of love and concern. We've heard about all too often they're ugly tirades that you can hear because of the amplification. And I'm at a point, I have no patience with this. Um, we hoped we had solved it. We hoped people had heard us, that we wanted this to be a place where you could have civil conversations. But I'm prepared to support the um, ban on amplification. Planned Parenthood and the people that go visit it aren't just pregnant people trying to get an abortion. There are so many other reasons that people go to Planned Parenthood. Sometimes it's to um, just dangerous things like ectopic pregnancies, but also just to get guidance and, and, and uh, learn about things in a safe, respectful uh, place. I also know that um, there was testimony the last time we were here. Oh, let me start that sentence over again. I'm the mother of an adopted, adopted child. I am glad that that mother went forward with the pregnancy so that I could raise my son, who makes me very proud. Um, but there was another person here who also was an adoptive parent, and he reported that Planned Parenthood does talk to the people coming in to have services and, and presents all different sides, that it isn't just um, a, a, an abortion mill. They try to find the right answers for the mothers and, and, and the potential child. Uh, so, so to say that just because they're going into the front door is is the result that you expect is completely wrong. Um, I do also have sympathy for the people who live around this and the strangers who drive by in front. Um, it, it is a scary moment to drive past these groups of people clearly with a mission I'm not going to call them pr protesters because I associate that with people who have only evil intent. They are people who are concerned but are so passionate about that concern, they don't leave a lot of other things, um, all the issues that potential um, customers, customers, patients um, are dealing with, and, and sometimes just food and, 
and books and taking care of it isn't the right answer. Um, so I, I am disappointed that this came back before us. I had hoped it was going to be done and over with and that it would be good for our community and that the people who are passionate have a chance to express their passion and remind people that they have alternatives. But it clearly isn't working, and so I also am going to support this. I am now going to ask for a motion. Mayor, I'd like to make the motion, and I will get the wording down on here. The, I would like to make the motion to waive further reading of the proposed ordinance and introduce the ordinance. And oh, is my, here we go. Sorry about that. Uh, and amending Chapter 16 of Title IV of the Walnut Creek Municipal Code to establish a restriction on the use of sound amplifiers of, around the reproductive health care facility located at 1357 Oakland Boulevard in the city of Walnut Creek. And I will second that if you were including the changes that were on the dice. As, as amended in our report. I will second that. May I have a roll call vote, please? Council, mem Council Member Wilk. Aye. Mayor Pro Tem Darling. Aye. Council Member Francois. Aye. Council Member Silva. Aye. Mayor Haskew. Aye. Motion carries unanimously. Aye. All right, that brings our meeting to a conclusion and an adjournment. And no, please don't. This isn't a happy situation. Um, and um, and uh, we have next meet in April 16th. We'll see you then.